Welcome to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. I'm glad you're with us today. Our guest is Barbara Messina. She is the mayor of the beautiful city of Alhambra. She's also president of the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments. And I use the term beautiful specifically because Alhambra is proud to have an Alhambra beautiful program. Tell us about it. Well, it started in the early 1980s. We had a wonderful dear old lady, and I, I shouldn't say the word old, matron of Alhambra. Well stated. Well stated. Mm -hmm. um, who started um, with uh, unbeautiful notices. This was before we had code enforcement and mm -hmm. it just really irritated her as to the conditions of a lot of the neighborhoods. And so when we got code enforcement, then we started our, our Alhambra Beautiful. And in that time, I was part of her committee. Mm. And then when she passed away, I thought, you know, this is too important of a, of a program to let die with her. So I took it on. That's nice. And, um, and what's nice is clearly Alhambra has a real civic spirit to it. We do. And you have volunteer programs in so many areas. Tell us about how we can get involved if we're a resident of the city of Alhambra. Well, there's many. We, we have a COPS program, right. which is Citizens on Patrol, and we have a Citizens Police Academy, and I think it runs for about four or five weeks, mm -hmm. and they take the citizens on drive-alongs and show them what they should be looking for. It's, it's really an extra pair of eyes to help our police department. And last year, they put in like 1,400 hours. It's a huge number. Huge number. And police reserves as well. You have volunteer officers we doing have, as we much have as they can. They put in over 2,000 hours last year uh, doing uh, community events. Um, what about senior services? We have, oh, we have the best senior service program. Our Joslyn Center for our seniors just offers a multitude of, of not only activities, but services to help them with their daily needs. Uh, we have recreation just for the seniors, for outings for them. And, uh, and what's so nice is while you're serving the seniors, you're also serving the young in Alhambra. And I can't believe that during these very difficult times, your city has managed to renovate a pool at the Granada Park. You're doing so much in terms of providing activities for young and old alike. That's because we have great planning. We have an awesome city manager who has an incredible staff that is very proactive. We don't react to the present. He's always thinking ahead and we've been very fortunate. And that is pretty stunning because as you know, some of your sister cities have really suffered. Yeah. San Bernardino, Stockton, Mammoth Lakes have filed for bankruptcy. I presume you believe that Alhambra is not at risk we're not of at, city bankruptcy. Yeah, no, we're not at risk. Why? We, because we've planned, okay? We have planned for the future. We were even able to put uh, out of this balanced budget money away for our reserves. Right. We have um, a general fund budget of 54 million. We have an overall budget of 115 million. And, and I understand your city has also used grants wisely. Uh, much of the money for the renovation of the parks, the pool came from the stimulus package, the right. federal stimulus package right. passed in 2009. Right. How were you able to access it? I mean, Al Alhambra is not a, a, a large city, but it's not small either. So. Well, a lot of that availability comes through our participation of being in the COG. Ah, the Council of Governments. Council of Governments. And it's there for cities to use and take advantage of. Um, like I said, it's the staff that you have that are real go-getters. Oh, but it's the mayor as well. <laughs> I do want to ask you, though, about the wonderful diversity of Alhambra. Yes. The entire San Gabriel Valley is just so rich and ethnic diversity, economic diversity, cultural diversity, Alhambra clearly benefits from that. Tell us about the rich diversity of your city. Well, we have a very high population of mainly Asians and, his, and Latinos, right. and a very small percentage of others. Right. Um, but we have, we have blended everybody together, so it's not s segregated. Sure. Uh, and we've been very fortunate that um, in doing so, we've provided 
information in all the languages so nobody feels left out. Mm -hmm. We have our uh, Lunar New Year parade. Of course, of course. Uh, for the Asian community and um, I do want to ask you though, you know, we talked about the stimulus package yes. and the ability for Alhambra to access the stimulus package. Alhambra was also one of those cities that used redevelopment oh. as a way to revitalize blighted areas. As you know, the California state government voted to eliminate it. The uh, California Supreme Court upheld that elimination. How are you managing without redevelopment? Well, like I said, our city manager is proactive. We have already initiated and got in place an ordinance on economic development. Oh, really? Tell me about the ordinance. Well, it basically gives us the same, um, the same uh, abilities as our redevelopment But did. are you raising funds? Is it a bid, a business improvement district? Or? No, it's, it's, it's a partnership with, uh, like we have a project that we're currently working on with a major developer to do a major project. Okay. I'm not gonna name Fair names, enough. but Fair anyway, enough. the incentives that our city manager works is um, uh, tax incentives where uh, you don't charge like full amount for Sure, your, no, I understand. I mean, you could, it could be a sales you, tax rebate, a property tax. Exactly. But, but, I mean, it's innovative, no doubt. It's very But innovative. you don't have the ability to cobble together properties no. like you did well, under redevelopment. Well, it gives us eminent domain power. Well, you've had that, so that we, helps. We have that. We really haven't had to use eminent domain. It's, it's a last ditch effort to I would be remiss if I didn't speak with you about the 710 freeway, oh, please which is do. <laughs> which is a please. source a source subject for so many. For those that are not aware, the 710 is a major freeway in the Southland, and for whatever reason, our forefathers and foremothers created a gap. How long? It's like a four or five mile I gap. I personally uh, have been involved working on this project for 28 come on. years. I swear to God. So, and sadly, though, we haven't seen much progress. Oh yes. We oh, have? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, correct me. Because right now you have Caltrans, Metro, oh, right. yes. Skag, no, everybody working, yes. coming together. We are in the, almost at the end of the environmental process. Let me ask you, has Alhambra taken an official position on whether it prefers a tunnel, light rail? Oh, definitely a tunnel. Tunnel, that is the preference. That's of, the one that makes the most sense. Sure. Okay, but in order to do the process, go through the process correctly, everything has to be looked at. Right. There were there were five tunnel possibilities that they looked at. There were 42 alternatives right. that were looked at. And now we're at the end of that community. So when I spoke with some of your colleagues maybe three, four years ago, the money was there, everything was great, the economy was humming along. It's a little different now. The tunnel process is expensive, I would presume. No, tell me, see, I love how you're correcting me, go. <laughs> because, no, it would never financially be doable if we had to depend on public money. So okay. where's? It will be built through a public-private partnership. Will it be a toll? It'll will be a toll, and you have companies in Europe, France, Spain, there's three companies that are waiting to bid on this project. But, I mean, tolls can be expensive, and does that make a, create a situation where there are haves and have-nots? No, because you have the option of not taking that or taking the five. It gives people... But the tunnel know, will be so much faster. Well, exactly, and, and, and nobody knows yet how much the toll will yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, are you hopeful it will be a reasonable amount? Oh, yeah. So yeah. when do we expect, assuming it's the tunnel, when do we expect construction to begin? 2015. Really? You're yes, that confident? I'm that confident. And when would it be done? We, it would take three years to do the actual construction. I had gone to a presentation uh -huh. many years ago when the um, consultant that MTA had hired, Dr. I think Iceman, he has since passed away and he, he did all the consulting on a lot of these tunnels. And his and, view? And his view was if we get past all of the uh, paperwork and the bureaucracy, the actual construction would take, I can't remember if he said two to three years. But it's close. But it's Hopefully close. by the end of the decade. Her name is Barbara Messina. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by another mayor from the beautiful San Gabriel Valley. His name is Michael Tui of West Covina. And sir, I thank you again for being on our program. Thank you for I want to speak me. with you about challenges facing cities throughout the state of California. As you know, recently we've had three cities declare bankruptcy. That's as of today, being Mammoth Lake, Stockton, and San Bernardino. Uh, talk to me about, uh, as a mayor, what you see on the landscape as a result to these municipal bankruptcies. Well, we've had to obviously tighten our budgets and watch it. I believe you're going to see um, shortly Fresno and Compton. You do think that will happen? Yes, we've already been sent those notifications. Fresno. Fresno I mean, and Compton. Uh, you know, Compton's insisting it's not going to happen, but you know. I'm <laughs> hoping for right. Eric Perrodin, um that it will not, uh, not happen. I want to talk about these bankruptcies, why they may have happened, and see get your take on them. The mayor of San Bernardino has said on the record that part of the reason why his city suffered this fate it was spiraling pension costs. Uh, what is your sense of the weight of pensions on cities in California? It is tremendous. I would agree with Mayor uh, Morris right. that that is um, the case. We have been able to negotiate with all of our union groups in our city. They have come to the table to help us. We're pr proposing a balanced budget August 1st or this year. Right, this year. Fair enough. Um, and um, they've agreed to pay their pension costs, which w w are a tremendous relief for us. Part of our other problem is still, no matter what, PERS is not getting a return on investments. Right, PERS being the California Pension Fund. They only got 1% last year, and this is like the second year of a 1 or 1.5% 1 return on investments. Does West Covina have its own um, police department and fire department? Yes. So we know that we honor our public safety officers, but we also know that these members can be very well paid, often obtaining overtime compensation, which can lead to some very high salaries. Mayor Morris of San Bernardino talked about that, talked about how there were so many public safety officers who were making over $100,000. We don't take away their desire to, to make more money, but that is a, a weight on a city. How does it impact West Covina, for example? It's similar. We have, um, you know, even the basic officer and firefighter, when you add in their overtime, they're clearly going to be over 100,000. Um, that happens as we've reduced our personnel in our police department. We've reduced over 28% uh, of our police But personnel. are you getting the savings if by reducing the ones that are still around are getting overtime? It is because you don't have to pay them the other benefits that come with it. Um, however, there is a point where it, stre st it stresses the system and you can't have your officers or firefighters working so much overtime that it puts the public at risk. At the same time, we know that, for example, San Bernardino is looking at whether they need to maintain their own city police departments, fire departments. There are plenty of cities that contract out with their local county departments. Is that something that cities should be considering? We have discussed it recently. We determined that we were not willing to do that at this time. Um, we had a vote in 1997, um, and it was around 75% to 25% not to go uh, to contract county services. Meaning a vote of the city, a the vote voters of the itself. Absolutely. I wonder what they would say today. What do you think? I mean, you're on the street. You speak with your residents all the time. I think they want their local services. People understand when you provide local services, they, they do, they can cost more, but you're getting a different level of service. I will tell you, people that have county, not knocking the county firefighters or the county deputies, um, they just have less people patrolling most of those areas per capita than we do. But I'm wondering if, if cities start to turn to the county, if that would change. I mean, if you have enough cities joining a county fire department, a county police department, sheriff's department, will all of a sudden it will get to a point that there will be adequate patrols. There may be ad adequate patrols, but the cost will be similar than if you, because the cost of all of them are similar. So we have five fire stations. The county proposed in 97 to only have three. Well, we could save money that way also. I want to get a sense from you about the impact of the elimination of redevelopment. For example, Mayor Morris, we keep mentioning him, uh, Pat Morris of San Bernardino has said 
that the elimination of redevelopment was devastating for his city that the dollars that they got, the tax increment from property taxes they got, helped to balance the budget. And when the redevelopment vanished uh, this year, it killed, really just killed the city even further. A redevelopment, it's a death blow. It crushed us F to the really? tune of $5.5 .5 million. And on top of that, the state keeps on taking away little bits and pieces. And they're not little bits, but right. to the state, it's 100,000 here, 50,000 there. Course. Every day we get a different memo that they're stealing some more money from the local government. Well, there is no doubt that the state is playing hardball on the question of recapturing redevelopment. I know several cities in the San Gabriel Valley, for example, Pasadena, Glendale, I'm not sure if West Covina joined in in a lawsuit last month trying to prevent the transfer of dollars. Uh, um, can you fight back? I mean, the voters did pass Prop 22, which said that the state should stop raiding local coffers. It wound up being a big problem as it related to a compromise that was a method to keep redevelopment alive, but uh, I'm getting in the clouds here. I mean, can you fight back? Um, we can attempt to. S some were at the mercy of the state because if we fight back, they have some provisions to punish us. Interest. In, in their they'll state charge interest. Code. Well, they'll take the money instant. Even if we're challenging it in court, they don't care. They'll take it from our sales tax money and let us fight for it later on. What about the possibility? You know, I had thought earlier this year when we spoke that redevelopment would somehow, some way, revive. It would come back from the dead, maybe as it relates to affordable housing, make it a, a program solely on pulling tax increment for that purpose. Now I'm not so sure with budget deficits continuing to rise in California, do you think there will be another form of redevelopment which will help cities avoid the ultimate death, which is bankruptcy? They have some more, uh, they have some redevelopment programs we can participate in. We kept our housing agency. Mm -hmm. We happen to have our own housing agency prior, so we continue that even though the redevelopment agency, um, some of it's right. gone, the housing component stayed. Do you have enterprise zones? No. Yeah, because that, that is one area that did stick around, that wasn't eliminated, but not many cities that had those zones. Uh, we also know that the recession played a dramatic role in these cities having to file for bankruptcy. West Covina, not quite in the Inland Empire, but getting close, and it was the Inland Empire that was hit incredibly hard by the housing crash, by the recession. How has West Covina fared throughout the recession? both municipally and as, as, a, as people? Municipally, like I said, we're down 28% of our employees. O only eight so far have been ever by layoffs. The rest were by positions that were vacant that we eliminated. Mm -hmm. So we're operating more efficiently. Um, on, a, on the redevelopment side or the economic development side, I we see. have around $250 million worth of new projects in the works currently uh, going throughout our different two different major mall properties and some other properties around. We have a lot of interest in West Covina. We just signed 85C, which, which is, is a Taiwanese bakery. Uh, it's a, tr it's a, it's a kind of like a, it's like Krispy Kreme. Oh, nothing wrong with that. They get 25,000 visitors a week and they, they projected to do eight to 10 million a year in a little 5,000 square foot you. thing, but there's gonna be like an hour, hour and a half wait Is it to open get yet? In. It opens in October. I was gonna say, cause we're in Irwindale today and that's, West Covina's right next door. So I mean, I, you I drive by. I haven't missed too many good meals in my day. I as can't you can tell. Well, come on, you're, you're a good man. <laughs> in our final moments, <laughs> Are you bullish on West Covina? Are you bullish on California cities? I believe California is going to come back no, due to no help of the state legislature. Oh um, Fighting words, no but, doubt. Um, You're not there, alone. There's no question. I believe I have a lot of confidence in other people you've had on your show, like mm -hmm. Mayor Messina. Right. Um, who? Mayor Pat Morris, who I know, I know Barbara right. and Pat both personally. And um, I think there's a lot of other great cities out there with great leaders, and the cities will prevail no matter what the state tries to do to us. We're going to overcome their ineptability to deal with their problems. Oh, my. His name is Michael Tui. He doesn't mix <laughs> his words. I'm Brad Palmer. And thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We continue our conversation about municipal bankruptcies with Jackie Robinson. She is a councilwoman in Pasadena. We just spoke with Michael Tui, who is the mayor of West Covina. And I wanted to talk to you as well about the challenges facing cities. As I mentioned with Mr. Tui, as we speak today, uh, we have bankruptcies in Mammoth Lakes, in San Bernardino, and in Stockton. What do you see? What's your sense of the municipal state in California? Well, I definitely think that while a lot of cities are struggling economically right now, that um, I think it's sort of an anomaly w with cities going into do um, you a bankruptcy. That? I do believe, because if you think about how many cities are in the state of California right. in totality, three out of that many is not enough, but you know, one is enough to you know throw constituents and residents into um, you know, a a somewhat of a state, a state <laughs> right. of panic and wonder what's happening with their own city. Mr. Tui believes, and it's as we speak today, that Compton could fall into bankruptcy. Even yes. Fresno could fall into bankruptcy. Yes. I mean, that's starting to get a little scary when you have cities of that magnitude. San Bernardino, Stockton, Fresno. Yes. I mean, these are major I think it's cities. very scary, but I think, you know, it when you look at the general fund of most cities, we know that you know a lot of these bankruptcies are coming as a result of uh, commitments to pension obligations that they have from way back and when, wanna, prior councils. I want to talk about that because, as I mentioned with Mr. Tui, Pat Morris, the mayor of San Bernardino, has gone on the record and said that he feels that one of the main reasons why his city has suffered and has been forced to file bankruptcy is because of pension obligations. Um, it's a common theme that we're hearing. What do you make of that? How does that compare to Pasadena, for example? It is, and you know, I think we know that in most cities, you know, your employee pension benefits and salaries is about 70% or right. more of the general fund, and that's a huge amount. And so I'm happy that in Pasadena, we've been working very closely with the city manager. We've had budget retreats every six months for the past two to three years making sure that we're up to date on where our finances are. We've um, been working very cooperatively with our bargaining units and you know our, our employees have been uh, very cooperative with helping us to get our pension obligations under control. And so Pasadena is on a good financial footing. We're not yet out of the clear, but we've been working steadily over the past two to three years to try to um, level um, our pension obligations. Do you feel as if you are at risk or you feel as if the negotiations have been effective enough that pensions won't sink the city? I, I have no concerns that pensions are going to sink the city of Pasadena. We've done a very good job in my opinion and we continue to work with our bargaining units and, and unions to try to get those under control. Um, I believe it was last year, at the end of last year, Pasadena faced a natural calamity, literally, right. and that was the windstorm. A, the windstorm. Mm -hmm. And often a natural disaster can just decimate the funds of a city. As I remember, uh, the city was not able to collect FEMA funds. And so how has that played into the uh, health of your city's finances? Well, we have used our uh, Pasadena water and water and power funds to try to recoup uh, some of some of those obligations and expenses associated with the windstorm. Um, the Pasadena Community Foundation mm -hmm. um, have worked with the city to uh, gain a uh, a foothold? A grant, a right. grant from okay. the Adwala Foundation, and so we were successful in that, and so we won $10,000 through the Adwala Foundation to be able to um, replant our tree, tree mm -hmm. supply in Pasadena, and so um, we're on good footing. We, w we would have, of course, preferred to be able to be reimbursed by FEMA right. and the state, but that was not possible, and so in the alternative, we've come up with um, other alternatives to be able to deal with those expenses. Uh, Mayor Morris of San Bernardino also said that one of the reasons his city has suffered and has filed bankruptcy is because of the elimination of redevelopment. Pasadena, I believe, did have a redevelopment agency. Did. Yeah, so talk to me about how your view of his statement and how Pasadena is adjusting. Um, well, we're dealing with the blow from redevelopment as well. Um, that is an 
something that we knew was on the horizon, so we, we, I believe we did a good job of planning for that. Of course, there's no way to recoup those millions of dollars that we would have gained otherwise mm -hmm. if it was still in place. But our city manager has been really good about you know, keeping us up to date, letting us know what options we have moving forward. And as I've said before, you know, just because redevelopment was eliminated does not mean economic development in the city has to stop. It just means that, you know, we're going to have to be more creative with the way that we um, look at our economic landscape and the things that we're going to be able to offer to incentivize development in Pasadena. Now, I know that in May, the cities of Pasadena as well as Glendale sued, brought an injunction trying to pre prevent the transfer of property tax dollars being shifted to school districts and other entities. Mm -hmm. That injunction was denied. Uh, I know lawsuits are still pending. It seems as if, and Michael Tui said it, the estate is really taking a very firm stand on this. And relations between state and municipal governments are very rocky. Talk to me about that. It is, but you know, we're lucky in Pasadena that we've had state legislators that have been very supportive. Assemblymember Anthony Portino, right. um, Senator Carol Liu, um, they have spoken up in Sacramento on our behalf. and. Um, Again, even though we're one city of many, um, we're hoping that the, the state can get a, a foothold on their own budget situation so that the local cities don't have to keep continuing bearing the brunt of the actions that they take do in you Sacramento. Yeah, do you think that in the next session, for example, that we will see a new type of redevelopment program created? There was a hope that would happen earlier this year, but it did not. It It'll didn't, but I know that uh, the, the, the local cities are pressuring Sacramento to come up with some type of alternative. I think we've seen, especially as our financial obligations to the new state development fund right. have come up, you know, the rules are changing every week, every day, because stringent rules weren't put in place before they put uh, eliminated redevelopment and so you know kind of nobody knows what's going on right now and so the rules keep changing and so are, are you as frustrated as Michael Tui for example I mean his words were very very strong very I mean he feels as if that the state is just acting in a draconian way and is, is hopping mad I mean, it, it is very frustrating, but again, I think especially with these elections coming up in November, uh, we know Governors Brown's um, tax initiatives right. um, will be on the ballot, and certainly we hope that they pass because if they don't, that will deal another blow to local cities as well. Has um, Pasadena? A lot of school districts are depending on that initiative to pass. Has and Pasadena so taken a position in favor of the tax initiative, meaning the council? We have not taken a position as a council, you but the have. legislative policy committee is actually going to be looking at um, a number of the initiatives that are going to be on the um, on the November ballot right. in, all, in September at our uh, meeting. So I want to talk to you about this initiative. Uh, you seem to be strongly in favor of it. Y you know, in June there was an initiative on the ballot that dealt with cigarette smoking. Who would have thought that the voters of California, not Kentucky, not North Carolina, but California voted no on a cigarette tax? Well, I think this is a tough economic client to be asking people to pay increased taxes, especially when there's no clear method that they can see of how it's going to help them individually. Um, you know, it's Pasadena at one point in time was uh, deliberating, placing uh, our own tax right. initiative, or uh, not tax initiative, a bond? but uh, a public uh, mm. safety bond on our November ballot. We have decided against that, decided it was too soon, and so we're studying the issue some more, and it might possibly be on our March 2013 mm -hmm. ballot. But I think the climate of California right now, it's going to be very hard to pass any type of tax initiative, and so we'll just remain hopeful. Because well, again, if it doesn't pass, that means more cuts to social services and other much needed services. Will you be speaking to your constituents about uh, Proposition 30 and speaking in favor of it because you are a councilwoman of a major city? Well, I actually have not taken a, as a individual or as a council member uh, a, a position for, for or against uh, Governor Brown's initiative, but this, the council again will be deliberating okay. taking a position as a body in September. Okay, her name is Jackie Robinson. She is a member of the Pasadena City Council. My name is Brad Palmer. I thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.